Hello, my name is Jonathan Friedman. I am a medical student. I prepared this talk on nasal fracture management for my plastic surgery rotation. I'd like to start by reviewing the pertinent anatomy, including nasal bones, septum, and cartilage. Next, I'll describe the mechanism of injury of nasal fractures, the different types of fractures, and while there is no universally accepted classification system, I would like to show the classification systems of three different groups to help demonstrate different approaches to nasal fractures. This should lead nicely into acute management and treatment and the numerous potential complications due to nasal fractures. Finally, we'll talk about reduction. The prominence and delicate structure of the nose make it vulnerable to a broad spectrum of injury, which accounts for why it is the most frequently fractured facial bone. The bony vault is a pyramid-shaped structure composed of paired nasal bones centrally and the frontal process of the maxilla laterally. Superiorly, the thickness of the nasal bones is greater above the level of the intercanthal line as they taper upward toward the nasal frontal suture. Below the intercanthal line, the thinner nasal bone projects anteriorly to join with the upper lateral cartilages at an externally defined midline point known as the rhinium. The septum is a key element of the structure of the nose. The posterior bony septum is made up of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid superiorly and the wedge-shaped vomer inferiorly. The perpendicular plate of the ethmoid fuses in the midline with the nasal bones to provide additional support to the nasal pyramid. This construct creates a tent-like structure, the ethmoid plate being the pole, and the nasal bones being the side walls of the tent. This interrelationship helps explain the susceptibility of the septum to injury by the transmitted forces from the external nose to the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Extending anteriorly toward the nasal spine, the superior edges of the vomer and nasal crest of the maxilla form a bony groove in which a thickened inferior portion of the quadrangular cartilage lies. This articulation represents the foundation upon which all of the overlying nasal structures rest. Mobility of the cartilage within the groove helps prevent septal fractures by allowing for slight lateral rotation during compression of the septum. A thickened osseocartilaginous buttress along the septoethmoid junction is the main strut for the bony and cartilaginous dorsum whereas a thick caudal septum provides the majority of the nasal tip support. The mid portion of the nose is composed of the upper lateral cartilages and the dorsal segment of the quadrangular cartilage. Made up of hyaline cartilage, these structures are fused as a single unit. The cephalic ends of the upper lateral cartilages overlap upon the nasal bones by as much as one centimeter in an area known as the keystone area. Laterally, the upper lateral cartilages do not articulate with the bony pyramid, but rather they are attached to the frontal process of the maxilla by a fibrous aponeurosis where sesamoid cartilages can be found. Thus, the attachments of the upper lateral cartilages with the nasal bones and the septum is crucial to prevent destabilization. The lower third of the nose is formed primarily by the alar cartilages and the fibrous fatty connective tissue that defines the nostrils laterally. The alar cartilages are billet structures composed of medial and lateral crura with an intervening middle segment known as the intermediate cruse. This has an important role in the definition of the nasal tip. These cartilages are interconnected as a single unit by a transverse fibrous connective tissue called the interdomal ligament. Structural support is mainly provided by the overlapped upper portion of the lateral cruce with the lateral border of the upper lateral cartilages and the medial curl attachment with the caudal septum. The dermatocartilaginous ligament originates from the superficial fascia of the superior nose and inserts into the intermediate cruce and caudal septum to provide additional tip support. By definition, nasal orbital ethmoidal complex fractures are a different entity than isolated nasal bone fractures. However, they are often associated with fractures of the nasal bones. The nasal orbital ethmoid complex is the confluence of the frontal sinus, ethmoid sinus, 
anterior cranial fossa, orbits, frontal bone, and nasal bones. The anatomy is intricate, and injuries are one of the most challenging areas of facial reconstruction. It is very important to recognize nasal orbital ethmoidal injuries because untreated or inadequately repaired nasal orbital ethmoidal fractures often result in secondary deformities that are extremely difficult or impossible to correct. Complications of nasal orbital ethmoidal fractures include blindness, telecanthus, an ophthalmus, mid-face retrusion, cerebral spinal fluid fistula, anosmia, epiphora, sinusitis, and nasal deformity. Accurate diagnosis and prompt surgical treatment of nasal orbital ethmoidal fractures are critical to avoid complications and to obtain an aesthetic surgical result. I am going to focus on just nasal fractures but I want to mention the treatment of choice for nasal orbital ethmoidal fractures is an open, direct approach with meticulous reduction and fixation, including any appropriate bone grafting. Make sure to consult the appropriate services, including ophthalmology and neurosurgery, if needed. The nasal bones are doubly at risk for fracture because they are protruding, but also because of lack of support and relatively thin bone. The maximum tolerable impact force before nasal fracture is approximately 30 Gs. These forces are relatively small compared to those required for other fractures of the facial skeleton. The next most vulnerable is the zygomatic bone, but it requires over one and a half times the force to break and it is not in as prominent a position. And superior, the supraorbital rim is one of the strongest buttresses on the face requiring 200 Gs to fracture. There is no standardized worldwide accepted classification system for nasal fractures, so first I want to show the different types of nasal fractures that occur. The fracture type will depend on the patient's individual anatomy and trauma etiology, but these examples more or less represent the general categories. The normal diagram shows the bony pyramid with the ethmoid plate being the pole and the nasal bones being the sidewalls of the tent. There can be a unilateral fracture where just one of the bones fracture, bilateral where both nasal bones fracture, and this can also include fracture of the septum. Bilateral fractures can be of the open book type where the nose would be splayed out, or the impacted type where the dislodged bones telescope and become depressed. Green stick fractures tend to occur in children before skeletal maturity. And finally, the comminuted type is when the bones shatter and is much more common in adults than children. The AO Foundation is a nonprofit European group. Its name comes from an abbreviation for Association for the Study of Internal Fixation in German. They have classified nasal fractures by anatomical grouping. Laterally displaced fractures occur secondary to a lateral blow to the nose. The nasal bones are pushed medially on the side of the impact and laterally on the contralateral side. They make up the majority of nasal fractures. Most of them can be managed by closed reduction. The dorsal part of the nasal septum is usually involved and can be displaced. Posteriorly depressed fractures occur secondary to a direct blow over the nasal bones which are pushed inside to the ascending process of the maxilla. The nasal septum is always involved. This type of fracture can be associated with nasoorbital ethmoidal fractures. Disarticulation of the upper lateral cartilages is usually due to a localized strong blow to the central third of the nose, as in car accidents with the nose hitting the steering wheel. The upper lateral cartilages can be avulsed from the bone. The diagnosis is mostly clinical because cartilage is not visible on standard radiographic imaging. Anterior nasal spine fractures can occur in isolation or in association with other nasal fractures. Displaced fractures are often associated with nasal septum dislocations and fractures. These fractures can occur in association to degloving injuries of the upper labial vestibule as in a steering wheel injury. Isolated anterior nasal spine fractures do not usually require treatment.
The other broad method of categorization is based on the direction of the impact force. This system was first described by Strank and Robertson in 1979. The classification is divided into two main groups, lateral and frontal, with further breakdown of the frontal type into three different planes determined by the depth of injury from the nasal tip. Lateral type injuries, which are more common, tend to have less severe damage and a better prognosis for both appearance and nasal airway function than the frontal types. Lateral force fractures rarely cause disruption of the osseous and cartilaginous components of the nose, and the degree of bony disruption varies from a slight depression of a single nasal bone to full lateral displacement of all structures. The second broad category described is the less common frontal impact fracture, which is subdivided into planes 1, 2, and 3 injuries. The planes of injury are coronal sections starting anteriorly with plane 1 and progressing posteriorly to involve more of the bony skeleton of the nose and ultimately the mid-face. They coincide with greater force of the impact. For the frontal force injuries, fracture in each of the successive planes is associated with a higher likelihood of residual deformity after reduction. Plane 1 injuries include damage to the anterior nasal spine, the anterior nasal septum, or the lower ends of the nasal bones. Also, dislocation and telescoping of the upper lateral cartilages and septum. Plane 2 injury results in more extensive damage to the nasal bones and ascending maxillary process, but does not involve the orbital rims. The septum has a significant amount of deviation and may lack stability to support the nasal dorsum. Plane 3 injuries are essentially naso-orbital ethmoidal complex fractures. Patients with this injury are usually found to have other mid-face and cranial base fractures, and the nasal bones and septums are severely comminuted and overlapped. Surgery for plane 3 injuries often is unable to fully restore the pre-existing nasal appearance and function, particularly if the orbital ethmoid complex components of the injury are not recognized and treated properly. This is a busy slide, but I wanted to show you another classification system based on treatment type. Ondex Group proposed this classification system after retrospectively analyzing 86 cases and sorting the different fracture types based on treatment patterns. The first three types, simple straight, simple deviated, and comminuted, were reduced with closed manipulation if the fracture was mobile. If immobile, or impacted, or closed manipulation failed, the fractures are repaired in an open operation. The last two types, severely deviated and complex, were treated acutely to repair the nasal septum and then the patients were brought back for a formal septorhinoplasty for any residual deformity or septal deviation. Now that we've covered the classification systems, I'll move on to epidemiology. Nasal fractures are the third most common type of fracture behind fractures of the clavicle and wrist, and they are the most common type of facial fracture. Most adult nasal fractures can be attributed to interpersonal altercations and sporting injuries, with a smaller number being the result of falls and motor vehicle accidents. Falls tend to occur more often in elderly patients, and here you can see a plain film of a comminuted nasal fracture from a fall in an elderly patient. Young men have a tendency to punch each other in the face, and here is a plain film of a displaced fracture. Assault, along with sports, likely explains the two-to-one male predominance of nasal fractures. Injury rates of motor vehicle accidents have fallen since the requirement of seat belts and new safety equipment, but with the increasing use of airbags in automobiles, there has been a shift in the mechanism of injury and the incidence of septal injury without concurrent nasal bone fracture has increased. Sports account for a large amount of facial fractures for a variety of reasons. Contact between players, like an errant fist or elbow, contact with equipment, like balls, pucks, or handlebars, or contact with the environment, obstacles, or a plane surface, like the wrestling mat, gymnastic equipment, goalposts, or trees. 
and actually an estimated half of all nasal fractures occur in the pediatric population. The incidence increases with patient age due to a number of anatomic and behavioral factors. Anatomic factors include the relatively high cranium to face ratio in young children, low impact falls in children due to their low height, the immaturity of the paranasal sinuses, the malleability of the pediatric facial bones, the prominence of the buccal fat pad, and the stability provided by unerupted teeth. Behavioral factors include the increased likelihood that very young children are more closely supervised by adults, the increased involvement of older children in recreational activities, such as riding bicycles and contact sports, and the increase in motor vehicle accidents and interpersonal violence among teenagers and adolescents. Now, the statistics that I'm showing here come from inpatient surveys for facial fractures. The incidence of relatively minor injuries to the nasal bones and nasal septum are likely underestimated as these types of fractures are more likely to be treated in the emergency department or in an outpatient basis and in many cases may not be evaluated by any physician at the time of initial injury. Any history of a fall or force directed towards the mid-face should alert the clinician of a possible nasal fracture. The clinician should obtain details of the injury, including the mechanism and location of the injury, as well as the direction of the force, because these details will allow the clinician to estimate the severity of the injury. The signs that suggest nasal fracture include deformity, swelling, epistaxis, and nasal obstruction. In the absence of other ocular findings, periorbital ecchymosis is highly suggestive of nasal fracture. In addition to changes in appearance, the patient should be evaluated for functional changes in nasal breathing and olfaction, as well as for bleeding and watery drainage with a sweet or salty taste that would be indicative of a possible CSF leak. Although loss of the sense of smell should be documented, poor nasal airflow as a result of edema is almost always present at the initial interview. Therefore, the sense of smell should be reassessed after swelling has diminished. Persistent anosmia or hyposmia may occur in as much as 5% of individuals who suffer head injury with or without nasal trauma, and it has been observed to resolve spontaneously in only a third of cases. A review of a patient's medical history includes any deformity, prior nasal injury, surgery, dyspnea, allergies, or sinus disease. Individuals who have had prior rhinoplasty are more susceptible to nasal fractures even after complete healing. Old photographs or detailed descriptions of previous nasal deformities should be assessed for significant changes. Up to 40% of normal individuals without a history of nasal trauma have evidence of significant malformation. A complete review of systems should also screen for associated trauma like ophthalmic or cervical spine injuries. Elevation of the head and use of cold compresses in the periorbital and nasal region can be helpful while waiting for edema to subside. Assuming there is not massive bleeding, preparation of the intranasal tissues for physical exam should be performed next. All clots must be carefully removed by swab or suction. Minor bleeding can usually be controlled by application of cotton pledgets soaked in quarter percent phenylephrine. When available, the use of 4% cocaine has the additional advantage of providing topical anesthesia. You can consider other analgesics before physical exam. Because most nasal fractures are associated with lacerations of the mucosa and skin, prophylactic antibiotics are often desirable. The antibiotics may also afford some protection against infection if a hematoma should form. Common antibiotics include penicillin, ampicillin, and cephalosporins. Saline irrigation is also useful to maintain humidification and to clean the mucosa. If obstruction of the nose or paranasal sinuses occur, decongestants can be added to the medical regimen. Regardless of the nature of the nasal injury, it is important to perform a thorough internal and external assessment of the nose. 
Every new evaluation begins with an assessment of the ABCDs, airway, breathing, circulation, and disability of the cervical spine and brain. The key to a successful examination is to ensure patient comfort, adequate lighting, and proper intranasal preparation. With the patient seated in a slightly reclined position, the external nose should be visualized from frontal and lateral views, looking for changes in dorsal contour, such as humps and abnormal elevations and depression. Abnormal shortening of the nose may suggest a loss of central support and a telescoping of cartilaginous fragments. This may also be seen by a retracted columella, an increased columellar labial angle, and widening of the base of the nose. A flat, broad tip or abnormal widening may be a sign of recent or past cartilaginous injury. The external nose should be examined via bimanual digital palpation. Steps, humps, crepitus, and point tenderness are all signs of nasal bone fractures. Step deformities are diagnostic of fracture sites, old or new. Echomosis or the presence of a hematoma should also be noted. Intranasal anatomy should be assessed using a nasal speculum looking for septal deviation, mucosal laceration, or septal hematoma. In most cases, post-traumatic edema will mass settle deformities, and a more accurate external examination is possible after resolution of swelling in two to four days after the injury. This is especially true in children with green stick fractures, as they can be difficult to palpate even in a cooperative patient. It is really important not to miss these because a little external deformity may actually involve dramatic internal derangements. Because the nose occupies such a prominent and accessible position, careful examination is possible and may obviate any need for radiographic study. That's a good thing because the effectiveness of plain film radiographic evaluation for routine nasal fractures is highly questionable. Plain radiographs have high incidences of false positive and false negative interpretations and lack predictive value with regard to management of the injury because of complex anatomy around suture line. The midline nasal suture, the nasal maxillary suture, and developmental abnormalities of the nasal wall are frequently misinterpreted as representing fractures. Also, these views are unable to distinguish recent from old fractures. In a child, x-ray evaluation of nasal trauma proves to be even less value than in the adult. The fact that the child's nasal bones are small and not fused complicates the interpretation. Furthermore, the majority of the injuries occur in the cartilaginous skeleton, which comprises two-thirds of the nasal substructure and cannot be evaluated by x-ray examination. A facial x-ray series should be ordered when other facial fractures are suspected. CT is also useful to assess for other associated injuries as well as the extent of nasal injury, especially septal fractures. Photographs are useful and necessary for documentation and comparison with pre-injury photos. Photographs should include the standard angles used in facial analysis, frontal, left and right lateral, left and right oblique, base view, and often a bird's eye view. Appropriate timing is essential for obtaining the best realignment possible. There are three windows for reduction of nasal fractures. The immediate window is a short window one to three hours after injury, but before swelling and edema obscure the area. This is not feasible for most patients because they don't present in time and you first have to have proper assessment of the bones before you can reduce them. Also, the patient may not be able to give proper consent because they are intoxicated or have altered mental status changes due to concurrent injuries. The patient may also want to wait for an expert plastic surgeon. Next is the intermediate window, approximately four to 10 days after injury or up to two weeks depending on some surgeon's preference. At this time, the swelling of the nose has decreased, but the bones have not started to completely fuse. If the intermediate window is missed, 
because a fracture is first identified after significant bony healing has occurred, the patient must wait for the delayed window three to six months after injury. This time allows for normal healing of the nasal bones and septum and a conventional refracture and align approach. As a result of nasal trauma, bleeding can develop in the subperichondral plane of the septum and blood can collect on both sides of the cartilage, forming a dreaded septal hematoma. If the hematoma is not drained, the blood supply will be interrupted, the tissue will become ischemic, and there will be irreversible damage to the underlying cartilage. Irreversible damage can occur in three to four days with loss of cartilage in important areas of the nose, leading to a saddle deformity and retraction of the columella. The diagnosis of septal hematoma is made on the finding of persistent nasal pain and excessive swelling of the septum. Once the condition is suspected, the hematoma must be treated immediately with incision and drainage and packing to prevent reaccumulation. Antibiotics should be given as long as the packing is in place. Although septal hematoma can occur in all age groups, it is more common in children. It is suspected that the softer cartilage of children predisposes them to a more significant injury risk. Excessive hemorrhage presents a severe risk to the airway. If compromise of the airway is at all suspected, an endotracheal tube should be placed. The airway can also be indirectly at risk as blood will fill the stomach leading to risk of vomiting and aspiration. To treat this, the provider can consider an OG tube. With excessive hemorrhage, it is first important to control the patient's blood pressure and then apply a vasoconstricting nasal decongestion like quarter percent phenylephrine or use 4% cocaine. Visible anterior sources may be cauterized with silver nitrate or sealed with topical materials such as a gelatin foam or fibrin glue. If unsuccessful, you have to consider tamponade with either packing or a balloon catheter or direct endoscopic cauterization, or you can even do angiography with embolization to embolize the feeding vessels like the maxillary and sphenopalatine arteries coming off the external carotid or the ethmoid artery coming off the internal carotid. Nasal packing is the most common method of controlling bleeding within the nose. The packing should be placed precisely at the bleeding sites to provide uniform pressure over the entire area. If the bleeding site is located in the anterior part of the nose, anterior packing will usually be sufficient. Half-inch plain gauze impregnated with an antibiotic ointment should be layered from the floor to the roof of the nose. If the bleeding is from a more posterior site, traditional posterior packs may be necessary. Bilateral packing is important for maintaining persistent pressure over a wide area. In most patients, packing will control nasal bleeding and after two to five days, the packing can be removed. Traumatic injury to the nose can cause fracture of the cribriform plate and cerebral spinal fluid leakage. This is important to monitor closely because you have a direct opening to the brain, which can lead to meningitis, encephalitis, or a brain abscess. Most leaks close spontaneously in 75 to 80% of cases, but you should probably consider a consult to neurosurgery if you suspect it. You can suspect a CSF leak if the patient has a salty or sweet taste in their mouth, or a persistently runny nose after nasal decongestants are given the fluid will be straw-colored or clear. The simplest way to diagnose the CSF leak is to visualize the CSF with the tilt test. The patient drips the fluid onto a piece of paper that responds to glucose. The blood will clot in the middle, and the CSF will keep running off, forming a halo. This diagram represents a positive halo sign. You can also get a CT scan with thin coronal cuts or measure the glucose concentration of the leaking fluid and compare it to the concentration in the serum. The CSF glucose concentration is 60 to 80 percent of the serum. Beta-2 transferrin, also known as tau protein, is produced by neuroamidase activity in the central nervous system and is only located in the CSF, perilymph, and aqueous humor. An assay looking for beta-2 transferrin is highly sensitive and specific 
and is currently the single best laboratory test for identifying CSF. For highly suspicious but non-diagnostic CSF leaks, some advocate for intrathecal injection of CT contrast or fluorescent dye to visualize the leak. Other early complications of nasal fractures that may occur with more extensive injuries include emphysema of the face and neck, orbital blowout fractures, and nasolacrimal duct injury. As long as the source of the emphysema is identified and closed, usually there are no complications. Blowout fractures occur because the orbital floor is made of thin bone and tends to crumble. This makes sense because you wouldn't want your eye encased in bone and crushed after a strike to the face. You would rather have the bone give way. With blowout fractures, the patient would complain of diplopia. Nasal lacrimal duct injury commonly occurs in high force comminuted fractures and requires an ophthalmic referral. I'm mentioning infection again because it can be caused iatrogenically with nasal packing. Don't leave the packing in too long. About two to five days is usually enough. Because it can cause sinusitis or toxic shock syndrome, you can consider an anti-staph antibiotic like napacillin. Late complications include synechiae, nasal vestibule obstruction, residual osteitis, malunion, and nasofacial disproportion. These complications are generally treated with surgery. Since many nasal fractures occur due to sporting injuries, a big question is when athletes can return to play. The nasal bones are thin and heal relatively quickly. The bone healing process begins with an inflammatory reaction hematoma for up to five days. This is followed by callus formation, first a soft callus, then a hard callus, for four to 40 days following the fracture. The remodeling stage occurs 25 to 50 days after the fracture. Based on this healing schedule, it has been recommended that athletes not participate in activity for the first 20 days following the fracture, light activities days 21 through 30, non-contact drills days 31 through 40, and lastly, full contact training and gameplay after day 41. For combat sports, return to activity is recommended no sooner than three months following the fracture. Any athlete returning to competition without complete bone healing needs adequate protection, such as a full face shield, modified batting helmet, extended hockey eye visor, or larger football face mask. This is a carbon fiber mask that LeBron James wore after Serge Ibaka broke his nose. The mass distributes a frontal force away from the nose and onto the zygomatic bones and supraorbital rim. LeBron James did not miss a game. Closed reduction is suitable for the simple non-comminuted nasal fractures where nasal deviation is less than one half the width of the nasal bridge. This technique depends on reversing the vector of force that caused the injury. It is appropriate in the immediate and intermediate windows for reduction. Closed reduction can be performed under local anesthesia with infraorbital nerve block and with a topical anesthetic and vasoconstrictor like cocaine. IV sedation can be added or general anesthesia can be used according to surgeon and patient preference. Advantages include that it may be faster than open reduction and that there is no external scar. Since the ligaments that support the nasal tip are not disrupted, there is little chance of tip edema or loss of tip support. If closed reduction fails, the patient must wait three months for bone fusion in order to perform correction of the fracture with an open reduction technique. I want to further discuss general versus local anesthesia and a recent meta-analysis on the subject for the treatment of closed nasal fractures. The authors asked the question, in patients with nasal bone fractures, does closed reduction under local anesthesia produce comparable outcomes as closed reduction under general anesthesia? They performed a systematic literature search for publications comparing clinical outcomes between local anesthesia and general anesthesia for closed reduction of nasal bone fractures. They found 367 literature publications but only eight fit their inclusion criteria that the studies must be in humans, 
be randomized or quasi-randomized controlled trials, controlled clinical trials, or retrospective studies. They found that there was no statistical difference between local and general anesthesia for closed reductions of nasal bone fractures with regard to patient satisfaction with anesthesia, patient satisfaction with function of the nose, and need for subsequent retreatment. However, there was a statistical difference for cosmetic satisfaction with the appearance of the nose, and the authors conclude that general anesthesia is favorable. I think this study might be more applicable in places like Europe where OR time is more valuable and there is not the same freedom to bring patients to the OR. However, I still think this is an important point to bring up because it speaks to the philosophy of treating nasal fractures. Is a nasal fracture a problem or an opportunity? Remember that up to 40% of the population has nasal deviation. I think most surgeons want to bring the patient a better cosmetic result than before the patient's accident. Interestingly, in a number of different studies, the surgeons were more critical than the patients when rating the cosmetic results after reduction. The fact is that a more extensive closed reduction can be performed under general anesthesia, so it is no wonder the cosmetic results are better and general is the preferred anesthesia type. Open reduction is indicated for extensive fracture dislocation of the nasal bones and septum or when the nasal pyramid deviation exceeds one half the width of the nasal bridge. It is also standard to perform an open reduction if there is a persistent deformity after closed reduction. It is generally performed under general anesthesia and includes a range of techniques including septoplasty, osteotomies, and full septorhinoplasty. In numerous studies, open reduction is shown to be superior to closed reduction in terms of function and cosmetic outcome and reduces the need for repeat surgery to fix persistent deformities. The technique is better because it allows for a more accurate structural diagnosis with better exposure intra-op and better placement of grafts. I've intermingled a little bit about pediatric fractures in my presentation, but I want to finish with a slide dedicated to the treatment for pediatric fractures. A child's nose differs from that of an adult in several ways. Specifically, the underdeveloped nose has less frontal projection, is largely composed of cartilage, and possesses several growth centers. As a result, Pediatric nasal trauma often presents a unique diagnostic and therapeutic dilemma. Since the nose is easily compressible, it absorbs little of the energy from the striking force. This leads to the force being distributed to the adjacent maxilla and massive facial edema that tends to disguise the extent of nasal fractures in pediatric patients. The edema and lack of nasal skeleton rigidity make for a difficult physical exam. Also, children are not always cooperative, especially after injuries to the face. For these reasons, many pediatric injuries may initially be missed or ignored and can result in progressive deformity of the nose and mid-face. Actually, it is thought that many septal deformities in adults are due to minor trauma as a child or neonate that went unrecognized. When considering treatment for pediatric fractures, the most important factor to consider is the risk of damage to the growth centers responsible for normal nasal and facial development. Normal growth of the child's nose is mainly dependent on the septal cartilage. Animal studies have shown that removal of the septum during early life results in stunted nasal proportions and mid-face hypoplasia. The greatest amount of septal growth in children occurs in two different stages. The first stage is from birth to five years of age for both boys and girls. The second stage is from ages 8 to 12 for girls and ages 10 to 14 for boys. Closed reduction of displaced fractures is generally considered safe in young children, but any elective open surgical correction should be postponed if at all possible until after these critical growth phases are complete. I'll leave you with a summary of the key points. One, in a patient with a nasal injury, always examine the inside of the nose to exclude a septal hematoma. A septal hematoma needs urgent treatment. Two, isolated x-rays for nasal bone fractures are not necessary. 
However, if you have a suspicion of other facial fractures, this should prompt a facial x-ray series or CT. Three, there is no universally accepted classification system for nasal fractures. Proposed systems are based on force or direction of impact and anatomy. Four, there are three windows for reduction, immediate, intermediate, and delayed. Five, timing of surgery, procedure type, and choice of anesthesia is variable and is a decision between the surgeon and patient, but general anesthesia is preferred and the philosophy of most surgeons is to leave the patient with a better cosmetic result than before the injury. Six, pediatric fractures that require open reduction should be operated on only after skeletal maturity has been reached. I'd like to end with a fun slide. Why are the noses broken on the Sphinx of Giza and other statues? Well, in ancient times, a living statue was created to serve as an eternal home for the deceased soul, and in some sense, let them keep on living. So people who didn't like this person would smash the nose to kill the statue and destroy the person's soul. I hope you enjoyed this talk on nasal bone fracture management. Thank you.